Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to be here. Let me get my clicker over here. So, science fiction is becoming science fact. I mean, when we're looking around ourselves, we're seeing things that we thought were going to happen 20 years ago, the paperless office, autonomous driving. Right? Some of the things are still not quite here, but some things are here and we're wondering, like this is like Star Trek, right? Here's a great example. Here's a, uh, an app called Say Hi. I use this to speak to people in 45 languages in real time. Here's an example. The future is already here, it's just unevenly distributed. Well, not bad, huh? So the other day I was in, uh, I was in Tokyo. I had a 30-minute uh, conversation with a sushi chef about radioactive fish and right, using this app. Right? The next thing is happening is we're going to get an ear, an ear plug. Right? It's a company called Waverly Labs. And then the other person has an ear plug, and, and we just talk. And it switches back and forth in whatever language. Imagine if you can do this for logistics, transportation. You just speak and it comes out in, you know, Swiss German. <laughs> just kidding. Uh, that, I think that would be a little bit difficult, or Finnish for that matter. But uh, that is the future. Right? The future is already here. It's just unevenly distributed. And the last couple of years, you know, I've been doing the uh, futurism thing for almost 14 years now. And uh, I'll tell you later what that actually is. But I've done over 2,000 speaking engagements. In the last couple of years, the number one question I get from people around the world is the question about what is going to happen to us in a world that's becoming full-scale technology. Right? Everything is technology now. Dating, right? banking, music in the cloud, films in the cloud, right? railway, not in the cloud, right? but digitized. Right? So I wrote this book called Technology versus Humanity. I have one copy with me. I was going to give it to the Prime Minister, but couldn't find him. But So uh, it's available on, on the Internet on Amazon if you're interested, but I'll, I'll tell you some of the key uh, things that are entailed in the book. Now, this is really what I do as a futurist. I don't predict, I observe. Uh, in China, they say, if you want to know about the future, ask your children. Right? Because children pay attention, they have imagination, they don't have to make money. So they can observe. This is the most critical skill for the future. If you cannot tell me what is going to happen in five years, you will have a problem in two years. It's very important to be able to understand this. And as Einstein said, imagination is more important than knowledge. That's hard to comprehend because you know knowledge is important to all of us. Right? And Einstein had a lot of knowledge. But can you imagine what the world is going to look like in five years? In 10 years, the kids of my kids will live to be an average of 100 years old, right? longevity. The kids of my kids will not know how to drive a car ever themselves. Right? They'll just get in and it just moves. They will not know what a CD looks like. Uh, in fact, if I buy a CD now and I give it to my kids for Christmas, they call a therapist. Right? It's like, what's a CD? Why do we need this? Right? I mean, it's a mind-boggling pace of development. And I'd like to say, just before I kick off my presentation, um, the world is actually better than we think. You know, if we're looking at these stats here, it's mind-boggling. We always talk about our, the problems that we're having, <laughs> you know, increased problems. Look what we have already solved, right? Poverty, education, literacy. I mean, you can see all the stats on this website, but so I've, basically the future is better than we think. Many people now are afraid of the future. And that is because primarily because it kind of looks like the machines will take our jobs, the politicians don't know what they're doing, and we kind of don't have a clear path into the future. So this is a real challenge, I think, to, to beat the challenge. But really what happens here is that we're moving into a world of hyper-connectivity. You know, I live in Switzerland, so I, I use the cows. You know? uh, we are, in fact, connecting the cows in Switzerland. Right? So the cow can go and, and milk themselves using a, a radio frequency ID chip, right? It's 100,000 euros for the machine, but the cow can milk any time themselves, right? It, it changes everything. Hyperconnectivity changes social norms, political norms, some good, some bad, right? 
But logistics, transport, that's right on top of that list. Right? Cisco says we're going to have 500 billion connected devices in less than five years. I mean, imagine the possibilities and then imagine the liabilities, right? Security, the Internet of Things. Right? We move into a world where everything will be connected on every possible level. Our health records, our digital money, our media, of course our mobiles, ourselves. Some of that is not quite as good as it sounds, right? Because, you know, how do we protect our privacy? And those are kind of issues that we will have to solve. But transportation, I mean, you don't have to imagine much to think what connectivity will do to transportation. Right? Taking a, just a pod car when you enter the train station to go to the next destination, that's already happening in Biel and Switzerland. Right? Using uh, information technology will completely change shipping. I was at London Shipping Week yesterday, speaking for Immersat, and we talked about what's going to happen with shipping. I mean, clearly, of course, some things we may not have to ship anymore because right? we can 3D print them. And if you are thinking about oil and gas, right, this is a major thing here. It's quite clear, you know, where oil and gas is not the future. I'll talk more about that later. And it's a huge shift coming in what we do and how we do it. GE has just launched the first jet plane engine that was printed in a 3D printer. The entire engine. So what do we ship then? Then we ship the, we ship the printer, right? Not the engine. <laughs> so science fiction is becoming science fact. We're, we're talking to computers now. I don't know if you've seen this, but Amazon Echo, Cortana, Siri, now it's just about like I was showing you earlier, it's a year away from 100% perfection. So no more downloading an app, no more web page, you just speak to your know, wristwatch and say, you know, send that 20 kilos of uh, shipment of books to Puerto Rico and it just goes off and does it. Machines are getting intelligent. And, and this is a funny thing because we used to think of ourselves as intelligent, right? The, human intelligence, and now machines are starting to think. I mean, this is a strange thing. It's basically human plays as thinking. Here's a great example, Amazon Echo. I think you'll enjoy this one. Dinner in 15 minutes. Alexa, order more dog food. Based on your order history, I found Taste of the Wild dry dog food with roasted bison and venison. It's $53.69 total. Would you like to buy it? Yes. Alexa, order trash liners. I found Glad Tall trash bags. Would you like to buy it? Yes. Alexa, what are your deals? I have several exclusive deals. So, speaking to the machine like you speak to a friend, right? So I'm going to say, please buy my, my ticket on a first-class train from Riga to Dubrovnik, and we'll just go off and, and do it, and boom, it's done. Right? That's not far away. So that will change the way that we're thinking about things. You know, basically what we see here is, you know, the most important thing today is what is this exponential curve. And it's the curve that you know, Moore's law, Metcalfe's law, and so on. But here's the important thing. Technology doubles in power every 18 months or so. But in the beginning of the curve, it doesn't matter, right? Because you're underwater. <laughs> 0.01 is 0.02. But we're now at the takeoff point of the curve. Right? I mean, make no mistake about this. We waited for a long time for this to happen, you know, internet companies, digital transformation, but now we're at the point to where science is saying, yes, yeah, pretty much anything is possible. Quantum computing, artificial intelligence. So in just five to seven years, we're going up the scale to 128. That's 30 times as far as today. When we go up the scale, we go straight into the sky. Right? 30 times is a billion. I just don't, I mean, we can't even imagine what it would look like uh, at a billion times as far as today. That's only 30 years away. I mean, if you have kids, you've got to think about that, right? This is a world where we can beat cancer, where global warming can be defeated. And it's also a world of where we may have a war for data, right? So I'm an optimist. So I'm thinking basically, you know, what, what we're seeing right now is mind-boggling uh, possibilities. Hyperconnectivity, the Internet of Things, smart everything. This is a good, I'll get back to that later. But, you know, smart ports, smart farming, smart cities, possibly smart politicians. Quantum computing, 
right? artificial intelligence, the end of oil, right? painful but certain. Right? I mean, make no mistake about this, the end of oil is as certain as the end of cities. And what does it matter if it's 10 years, 15 years, 20? We're not talking about 50 years here. Right? I mean, to invest in oil today, well, think about that. I mean, Trump is building the pipeline, right? By the time the pipeline is done, nobody's going to want to buy his gas. So we're, get, we're heading into a world of then ultimately what's called the singularity. This is the convergence of man and machine. The point of when computers have infinite power infinite power. These computers that we're using today are, you know, they're like, 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 like Stone Age machines. You know? In 10 years, we're going to be a million times as fast on a consumer-grade machine. I mean, that's basically 400 quadrillion calculations per second on the human brain. That's what we do all the time, just like this. Computers don't really do that quite yet. Uh, give it five years and we'll be at that point. So clearly, I like to say humanity will change more in the next 20 years than the previous 300 years. And I would submit to you this is primarily positive. We are kind of worried about what that will do to us, and you know, we're becoming essentially superhuman, you could say. I mean, look at this, you know, where would you cut off, right? The wearables, maybe a, you know, a new arm if you had an accident, or connecting directly to the internet. Is that a good idea? But you know, becoming superhuman is, of course, an old dream, and really what's happening today is just there's more opportunities than anything else. I mean, look at this trend map. Huh? I mean, if you're in the business of transportation and logistics and, and supply chain, you just put a flag somewhere and it's a new opportunity. Huh? Our problem is not that we don't have opportunities, that we have to pick the right one. <laughs> right? We must urgently take a wider view as uh, the president of the organization was saying earlier, right? we, have to go, we have to take a wider view of the food chain, the ecosystem. It's not just about transporting goods or people. There's a whole new ecosystem. What do you think is going to happen with the big internet companies? Not Facebook and Google, but say Alibaba, Baidu, right? Alibaba is in 67 businesses. It's quite likely that Alibaba will run the public transport of Jakarta in the future. All of it. So thinking wider is not something we should just leave to Americans and our Chinese counterparts, right? We have to take a wider view to realize this. And this is the wider view in a nutshell. Point number one, data is the new oil. Right? Forget oil, as I said earlier. You see, I'm down on oil, but I keep telling you this, right? But data is the new oil. Right? In 2016, the data economy made more money than all of oil and gas and nuclear together. Right? $7.6 trillion. So whoever has the data and the biggest machine and the largest intelligence wins. Right? Just like whoever used to have the resources wins. But the resources are now being replenished. Right? The overlap of man and machine. The possibility of us using machines to become super intelligent. Virtual reality, right? I know you've ever seen this, but if you ever get a chance, try Microsoft HoloLens. This is a 5,000 euro device, but you can try the Microsoft Center or so. You just pull it down and you dive into a world of data like Tom Cruise and Minority Report. And that box is going to be 50 bucks in three years. If you're a log logistics manager, right, you, you have the power of a thousand people. Uh, in fact, you probably don't want to ever take it off, right, because it would be so interesting to use. Artificial intelligence. We should not be afraid of this because these machines don't think like we think. Right? I mean, human thinking is not even fully explored. We don't know what social intelligence is, emotional intelligence, consciousness, beliefs, ethics. These machines are just very, very large artificial brains that do a narrow job right, for the time being. They will do other things, but this is a really, really powerful tool coming to us. And of course, the Internet of Things. Throw the, all those four in a box, McKinsey says, $52 trillion new revenue streams. And this is why, because the money is so obscenely big, right, before you start salivating, right, this is why we need a counterbalance. Right? 
We need a counterbalance that says we're doing these things for human purpose. We cannot just do that because of profit and growth. Right? Because, you know, here's a, the challenge. The future is not an extension of the past. Just because you're BMW, Audi, or Mercedes in Germany doesn't mean you're going to be running the car economy in the future. It's the opposite. Well, of course, I think they're going to catch up, which is good. Right? Don't get me wrong there. But the future of the car is not to have a car. The future of the car is mobility. I mean, talking about a nightmare, right? This is a nightmare for German car industry. Right? I mean, they sold me a car for 150,000 euros, and three years later, it would be worth 50,000. And now I just buy a subscription right, to a car's mobility service. The first one, if you live in Philadelphia, Cadillac has a subscription. $1,500 to use whatever they have at any given time. If there's any Spotify users here, music people, right? Transportation will, to a large degree, become like Spotify. Personal transportation. You sign up, you use, everybody uses, everybody pays. So we're seeing these huge changes, and the bottom line is the ability to think from the future as opposed to about the future. There's a very big difference. I can think about the future and I say, well, the future means I'm going to use a mobile app here or I'm, I'm going to you know, make a deal with those guys in Kazakhstan to figure out how to, whatever, right? That's just going from here to today. Let's think about from the future. Five years from now, right? six billion people connected to the internet, right? the solar energy economy, digital money, maybe the blockchain, right? 3D printing, yeah, it's going to be a long time before we can 3D print, you know, wheat or corn, right? Yeah, but airplane engines, plastic parts, iPhone covers, tennis shoes. Yeah, we thought about this for 20 years. Didn't happen. That doesn't mean it's not going to happen tomorrow. Let's make no mistake about this. The future is not an extension of the present. Business as usual is dead. We may as well get the use to that now. Some things, you're lucky, they, they carry on, right? So you can hang there for a while, like in the telecom business. Right? You can sell SIM cards and data charges, you know, still making good money. The future of the telecom business is not to sell connectivity. The future of the car business, Tesla is worth more money than General Motors. Market cap, selling 150,000 vehicles. Right? Autonomous cars, explosion there, that's going to wipe out a lot of value somewhere else. Electric cars become the mainstream. Toyota and Volvo have said that within 12 years they will not make, no longer make any combustion engines, you know, gas engines. And they really mean five years. They just don't want to scare people. I mean, the future here is moving mind-blowingly fast, the possibilities of doing these kind of things, and, and I think that we're going to see stuff like, uh, you know, associated problems. If you make a clutch today, you live in southern Germany, you're one of the small companies making clutches. In a couple of years, there's no clutches in those cars. Huh? A regular car has 2,000 pieces in the clutch transmission. An electric car like Tesla has 22 pieces. Right? The rest is what? Software, right? So, you're toast. Right? You know what that means to be toast? It's an American expression, is to, to die. Right? I mean, if you're a clutch maker, you better face this now. So we have to think about where this is going to take us. Business as unusual, huh? two worlds, the old one and the new one colliding at the same time, actually happening at the same time. Tesla gives away all the patents for battery technology, $2.6 billion, gives them away to get other people to invest in it. Completely unusual. Google invests in contact lenses with Novartis, and Walmart has drones delivering the packages. All of a sudden, we have to think about business being different. And that is what these companies are doing. Make no mistake about this. The number one competition in all of your businesses are these guys. Right? The platform economy. I think there's a Russian company somewhere further down. Uh, Yandex. Or, but, you know, basically, it's, you can see here, right? US, China. 
So I think there's a huge challenge for us to come up to think about where this is going. And this is the thing that we really have to realize. You know, I used to be in the media business, and this is the curve in newspaper advertising. If you're in publishing, you're at the, the lowest possible point, right? What happened when the iPhone came along? All of a sudden, Google and Facebook said, okay, we can take this business. You see this curve, right? Everybody dies, Google, Facebook win. 91% of digital advertising is Google and Facebook. And so here's the principle of change, right? Gradually, then suddenly. How will transportation change? Very, very gradually, very slowly, and you've seen that, right? But then one day, everything lines up. Right? Connectivity, price, intelligence, politics, boom. Right? How long did it take for us to get Spotify, the music service? We tried this. I founded a company like Spotify in 1998. We couldn't get the record companies to agree. It took 15 years for that to be realized, and now you have 100 billion people giving 10 euros a month for music rather than downloading it from BitTorrent or, or YouTube. <laughs> so that's the speed that we're going to see things at, and, and the main thing that's happening in our future is the convergence of those two things, right? Humanity and technology. And we have to be very careful about this. You know, we should not invest in technology to reduce humanity. In my, in my book, I call this the convergence of algorithms and androrhythms, you know, human things. I'll explain a bit more shortly, but this is what's happening. It's a fantastic opportunity, but it's also very threatening. In the US, I like to say, if you can describe your job, it will be automated. In other words, a job that is so unique to you has no chance of being automated. It's impossible for a machine to learn. A pilot, airplane pilot? I think we will automate airplane pilots, but we're still going to have one in the, in the cabin for other reasons. This is a typical example of what's happening here. Right? Ethical issues are exploding. When the self-driving car goes around the corner and has to decide who to kill, how would they know? They're going to kill the frog or kill the baby or drive themselves against a tree. So when you're using technology, you're going to see more and more ethical issues. And one of the key questions is, how computable are people? Are we just fancy machines? If you live in Silicon Valley, I lived there 17 years. The belief is that humans are essentially code. Yeah? They're machines, fancy machines. And the belief is, in roughly 15 years, we're going to merge with technology. Now, in Europe, we don't like this idea, clearly, because we're humanists. I don't believe that humans are computable in such an easy way. If they are, it will take at least 100 years, right? I don't think we're going to live in a world where we become this anytime soon. But this is a key question when you think about business. Huh? My colleague, Luciano Floridi, who does lots of work in AI, he says something very important. AI is artificial intelligence, right? Algorithms outperform humans when it is not about understanding emotions, intentions, interpretations. Right? This is very important to keep in mind. And let them do it. Why would we not use the power of the machine if they're going to do that stupid heavy lifting for us? The routine, the monkey work. Are you going to feed the entire traffic patterns of all trains in Europe to a machine that's based on quantum computing? It would tell you in 14 seconds how you can save 10% of energy right, when it's done. Humans can't do that. City of Los Angeles put all the traffic lights online. Then they used IBM Watson to figure out what the patterns were. And Watson said, if you program the traffic lights differently, there's 8% less pollution in traffic jams. Humans can't do that. That's not a bad thing, right? But I mean, simple things like mapping or ordering something or a coffee maker, right? So here's the reality for us, and I think it's a good reality. Anything that can be digitized or automated will be. I used to say that when I was in the music business, you know, anything that can be digitized will be. Right? The much bigger challenge to us around the world is not globalization, right? it's automation. 
because machines will get so smart they can do stuff that we think are ours, right? And here's the thing, we are not going to be useless humans because of that. If you know the book uh, Homo, Homo Deus, right? talks about being useless humans, right? Anything that cannot be digitized or automated becomes extremely valuable. And what is that? It's 95% of our lives. You wouldn't be here if that wasn't the case. You could be watching on YouTube or on the live stream. You come here because of relationships, eh? because of meetings, because of significant experiences of a sort. Eh? These things here on the left, the algorithms, the human things, that is what drives business. It's actually not the machine that does it. So it's very important for us to realize, let's use the machines for the groundwork. Let's let them figure out what is the smartest thing to do. Let's figure out how they can be accountable also for that. <laughs> so what that means really in terms of skills, you know, we have to move forward and change our skills. Here's the 2015 list from the World Economic Forum, morphing to 2020. This is important for us, but especially for our kids. Huh? The number one skills in the future Critical thinking, creativity, emotions, right? Emotional intelligence. It's hard to describe what that is. <laughs> Cognitive flexibility. If you said this 15 years ago, you want to hire people who are critical and creative and emotional, you get fired. And now we want the opposite. That is because the only thing that machines can do in the future is what we can do, what only humans can do, right? If I meet you later in the hallway and we talk, it takes an average human 0.4 seconds to recognize the other human. Recognize in the widest sense, without saying a single word. What kind of person you are, do we want to connect or not? And when you talk to a customer, you know as well as I do, most of the things you learn from talking to the customer is the things that they're not saying. Right? Is the, the thing that you're getting without actually saying it. So it's those things, I think that's our future in terms of education. You can see already here uh, what's happening. The Economist has a great chart. Anything that's routine, machines will do it. And that is why in our businesses, we should look at stuff and say, if it's routine, automate it. If it's not a human routine, right? <laughs> if it's something we can just do, any friction, right, we can remove. I mean, you can say what you want about the new digital businesses like Uber and Airbnb, but they are the masters of friction removal, right? They take out the friction. So when you, when you get an Uber in London, you just call it up and you hop in and then you get out without paying, right? It's just all automatic and it's completely seamless. It may not be fair to the driver, that's a different discussion, right? But it, you know, it's frictionless. Frictionless transport, that has to be our... That has to be our approach the first port that does frictionless shipping right, will wipe out all the other guys. And I think this is a very big discussion that we're going to see where that takes us. You know, our biggest challenge is not that machines will kill us. Forget about Hollywood and Ex Machina and you know, Black Mirror. And it's interesting, right? but our real challenge is that we don't become like them. Right? That we start thinking of our customers as algorithms, you know, anything can be programmed, is far from the truth. So, what really happens here is that we have to be careful that we don't resort to this, I call this machine thinking, right? Everything is an algorithm. Well, it's, algorithms are very helpful. I would encourage you to invest in algorithms. But, you know, really, is we don't want to get to that point to where we have this judgment erosion, where we can't do anything by ourselves anymore. Right? So, Basically, in this world, we're looking at technology in two ways. It can be fantastic or it can be terrible. It's up to you to make, it, make sure it's good. I mean, bad technology is always terrible, right? So if the website doesn't work, it's always terrible. But an engine that would say, for example, human resource analytics that analyzes your people in the company and then fires people automatically, that exists. I think that's more here on the, on the devilish side. Now, technology has no ethics. And this is why it's important. Ethics is the difference between doing what you have a right to do or the power to do and doing what is the right thing to do.
And I would propose to you that if you have an ethical business, you'll go further. It doesn't look like it sometimes when you look around, you know, and say, well, you know, that's interesting, well, maybe that's not quite the reality, but I think we're getting there in very, very large steps. Because, you know, this is our reality. We're holding those cards, the same cards we've had for thousands of years. That's, that's just human. Right? Technology is exploding with new things. Always adding new things. Right? Intelligent machines will change our world more than anything else in the last 50 years. And again, I would say most of that is opportunity. It sounds challenging when you think about, you know, call centers. 40 million people work in call centers around the world. 39 million of those will lose a job. Because, yeah? you know, call centers, you don't have to have empathy necessarily to run to work. I mean, it would be an added value, right? <laughs> but, I mean, clearly machines can learn that. When? Five, seven years, maybe three years. I've already seen trials where I couldn't tell the difference. So here's some examples about those machines, intelligent machines. Autonomous shipping. We'll always have people on ships, but autonomous shipping is a certainty. Right? I mean, it's a fantastic opportunity. Self-driving cars, we will not have self-driving cars on the German highway, the Autobahn, going 250 kilometers an hour uh, anytime soon, but we will have them in cities right, where we can do these kind of things while we're driving. Sort of global brains that analyze our consumer behavior, give us recommendations, or we already have that. Machines that help us recognizing things like food, taking pills, machines that make hamburgers. Right? Burger King and McDonald's are looking to automate the entire, well, restaurant in parentheses. Right? Right? I mean, literally one person run the whole thing. Will probably taste even better than it does today. Uh, Spotify makes lists, playlists, right? This is the most amazing thing on Spotify, the music service. Fantastic playlist, machine makes it. Right? Google is launching a new feature to smartphones this week called Smart Reply. It scans your emails and suggests replies. The system was created as a tool to help take the hassle away from replying to emails on smartphones. The email assistant scans which emails can be answered with a short reply and suggests... Bob Dylan. To improve my language skills, I've read all your lyrics. You've read all of my lyrics. I can read 800 million pages per second. That's fast. My analysis shows your major themes are that time passes and love fades. Well, that sounds about right. I have never known love. Maybe we should write a song together. I can sing. You can sing? Do be bop, be bop a do. Do be do be do. I like this video because it shows that at a certain point it's just ridiculous, right? I mean, Bob Dylan says, you know, you're not going to sing. Right? The machine is still very useful, but it's not going to be Bob Dylan. Right? I think it's, it kind of shows where the future is going with what we can do with this. You know, Basically, here we're seeing this shift to a digital ecosystem of transportation. And I mean that both in the terms of digital transportation, like actual digital transportation, right? 3D printing, holograms, in 10 years, I'll be going to the airport in Zurich and I will go into a holographic room that costs a million dollars and I will show up in Singapore for a meeting. I can already do that. It just costs two million dollars. And Swiss Air Lufthansa will sell tickets for those kind of trips. So we're going to see a lot of change here. We're going to see things that are based on this paradigm of, of data and intelligence. Bottom line is data is the new oil and AI is the new electricity. If you think about that in, in regards to transportation, it's not enough just to have data. You also have to have intelligence. And the bigger the data gets, you know, trillions of data, real-time data feeds, there's just no way we can make sense out of it. We need artificial intelligence, intelligent assistance to make this work. I mean, you see here what's uh, been pointed out, you know, all over the world. This is the new holy grail, basically. I mean, every single investment, Google has bought 37 companies with artificial intelligence. And here's what your neighbor is saying. Right? Putin says that the world that leads in AI, the nation, <laughs> will be the ruler of the world. Well, that is one scary message. But look at the other one. Right? Beijing wants to be AI to be made in China. 
So, so there's a lot of things that we have to think about here. What does it mean for the global situation? Where are we going? We're going into a world where everything that needs to be done is becoming smart. There are some exceptions. I will not touch who that is, but you just have a smart converter. I say this jokingly, but you know, again, this is amazing. Right? Smart farming, smart city, uh, smart cars. Uh, basically, everything around us is hugely becoming uh, networked and intelligent in real time. This is the low-hanging fruit. Right? This is the first thing to invest in. Uh, this is the Internet of Things with the possibility of connecting everything. I mean, what we're doing with the Internet of Things, we're essentially creating this, right? A nervous system, a meta-intelligence. And that can be both very powerful but also very dangerous if we don't find a way to secure it, right? I mean, why would you put your data there if it was like Facebook or, you know, or, or, or Google Plus or something? Right? That would not be a good idea. And we need ethics. We we'll decide what is good to do and what is not good to do, what is actually human, what is not human. And on that note, I want to say that you know, a lot of people looking at technology and saying, our oh, technology is great because it makes things efficient. Right? It's completely mistaken. Efficiency is great, the CFO loves it. Right? Optimization is great, but if you're only using technology to be more efficient, you're barking up the wrong tree. It is the idea of creating something entirely new that technology allows you to do. You should do something because technology makes it possible, not despite technology making it possible. <laughs> I mean, you see the digital native companies like Google, Facebook, Alibaba, Baidu, Amazon, right? That's what they do. They don't make just existing stuff better. They do something completely new. I guarantee you, if you could do that here in Riga, do something completely new using technology, that's how you win. You don't win by competing on the old field. You don't win by investing in oil and gas transportation. Right? That is the past. It, it, you're lucky enough that it's still here. Right? I mean, think about where this is going, what the future is, the mega shifts. I have a website called megashifts.com where you can see them, but I won't have enough time to go through all of them. But basically, this is what's happening in logistics. I'll give you some brief examples here. Right? Connected cities, the industrial internet, the internet of things, 3D printing, Companies getting into business that's completely outside of their old business. Right? In the shipping industry, for example, has been completely insulated from this. Right? That is over. I mean, when we have automated ships, who is going to run the automated ships? Does it have to be a ship maker? Right? It's going to be a digital company. So when we look in this direction, clearly, I mean, the, the future has mind-boggling challenges. Right? Automation, datafication, cognification. And the question will also be, okay, automation. I would ask the question, what should not be automated? You know what the answer is, right? Anything that's important to humans should not be automated, even if it's inefficient. Because if you would automate anything that's inefficient, it would not be human. I mean, humans are the master paradigm of inefficiency, right? We, we lie, we cheat, we make mistakes, we make up stories, we get drunk, we have to eat, we have to... Right? It's a nightmare, right? Humans are chaos. Right? So we really need to think about this, where this is going, what we want to achieve. You know, those big internet platforms have achieved the virtualization, right? Bezos is very happy with his status as being the digital king, so to speak. And he's launching one cool thing after the other. This is Amazon Go. You just go into an Amazon store, you have a mobile app, and you don't pay, you just leave. It just checks you in, and now with the new Apple thing, you can use your face for that, I guess. I mean, the convenience, right? You just walk in and leave. That's the kind of stuff you have to invent for transportation. Why, why does it take Amazon to invent this? I mean, we're looking at a world that is going to be impacted by things like the blockchain. In my view, that is not next year. That's three to five years away before that becomes a real tangible reality. But clearly, I mean, you know, the blockchain is like you, you can't avoid looking at it. Maersk already looking at this. Right? I mean, there's, every day there's an announcement saying we're going to invest in blockchain technology. <laughs> right? So read the book by my friend Don Tapscott. It's called The Blockchain or Blockchain. And that's how you all know about it. But so. What's happening here is that basically this future is what I call a hell then, right? It's heaven and it's hell. Because, you know, we can use these technologies 
in any which way. We can use it to destroy jobs and we can use it to build new jobs, which are clearly going to happen. We're going to need some wisdom. We don't just need looking at saying, okay, my, you know, my, my, uh, my margin is up, you know, it's good. Right? Th that will not work here. I mean, if a telecom company gets rid of 90% of their employees because they automate telecom maintenance, should they not pay an automation tax? Right? But that would be, of course, not really fair. <laughs> right? So, right now we're in this lucky place. Consider yourself lucky. We're in the place where 90% is heaven. Let's keep it that way. Let's apply a humanistic approach to why we're investing and what we're investing. Let's not fear technology, but just let's not blindly rush into whatever it can do next week. And this is what makes us European, is that difference. So in a nutshell, here's kind of a roadmap, and then I'll, I'll wrap up. So this transformation means we have to digitize, we have to mobilize, we have to personalize, we have to use data, we have to virtualize, we have to cognify, become smart, and we have to humanize. When you download the slide deck later, you can take a good look at the different steps. We'll be distributing it later because there's a lot of stuff here. Right? So in a nutshell, this is our future. Technology will be exponential, and we're still the same. We are not going to keep up with technology. We're at the takeoff point to where, right now, we still can, right, around here. In five to seven years, game over. Right? In 20 years, billions time. Right? So what makes us worth living, right, is exactly that. As the world becomes more digital, it is the humanity that differentiates us. The CEO of Walmart said this. Right? Interesting message, because, you know, they're they're a company that automates a lot, right? So think about this. Most importantly, I think for you today, I saw this coming up earlier, in this future that is based on so rapid changes, the only way that we can deal with that is to hyper-collaborate. Don't hyper-compete, hyper-collaborate. Because that's how you're going to keep up with the exponential change of things. My final message is for my book. We must embrace technology, but not become it. I think that's the future that would work for all of us. Thanks for listening. I give you a quote from David Bowie. I'm done. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. We have uh, one uh, single question for you to get the prize. Mm -hmm. uh, to get the prize, one single question. And the question is, we are posting, because the conference is about uh, uh, excellence, skills development of this region in, in logistics and transport. How do you see in this big picture you are, you are uh, illustrating here Latvia as a place, uh, main challenge and of course might be the main opportunity? Well, I think for all small countries, you know, I live in Switzerland as a small country. Right? For all small countries, it's really important to not look at what's working today but to see what's going to work tomorrow, like not in 50 years, but in five years, and to build the tomorrow. Right? Look what happened in Singapore. I mean, you can say many bad things about Singapore for other reasons, but they believe in the future. Right? So if Latvia is going to be successful in five to ten years, it's going to be about the future. It's not going to be about the current present. Right? It's going to be about a new future that can be invented here. Right? And the challenge? Because belief is like, uh, well, that's like this positive aspect, opportunity to start belief, at least what they said to the, me the in challenge church. is that The challenge, I think, is for all established uh, business processes is that you, you think that is basically going to continue as it is now, or you feel strapped in what is the current situation, right? So the best thing to do is to say, well, we leave that over here, we continue this, and then we have a new thing that we also do, it's called hybrid thinking, right? So the challenge is to do what makes money today, and then figure out what's going to make money tomorrow at the same time. Right? And that is, that is actually better for small countries, because right? you can move quicker. Thank you. Thank you very much. Applause one more time, Thank Gert. You. Thank you.